Assalamu alaikum sir. Sir, can Please, you hear me? Umar, I can hear you. Uh, sir, your voice is breaking down. Um, so it, is still, so it is still breaking down. Your voice is breaking down. My voice is breaking down. G, sir. And I don't know. Uh, okay. आप कुछ बोलिए जी सर कैन यू हेयर मी जी आई कैन हियर यू लाउड एंड क्लियर परफेक्ट सर दिस वाज क्लियर परफेक्ट कैन यू हियर मी यस सर आई एब्सोल्युटली कैन एंड हाउ इज द ऑडियो ऑडियो इज ओके एंड जी सर द ऑडियो इज क्लियर राइट नाउ ओके सर सो वी जस्ट वेटिंग फॉर जी सर ठीक है ठीक है मैंने कर परफेक्ट सर गुड मॉर्निंग मिस्टर स्टीव कोल हाउ आर यू आई एम गुड थैंक्स हाउ आर यू आई एम गुड थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू फॉर बींग विद अस एम आई ऑडिबल यस Can you perfect. hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, you're you're perfectly audible. Uh, we have with us Ambassador Asif Durrani. He's a senior research fellow at IPRI. He's going to be one of the discussants as well. Hello, Ambassador. Hello, nice Hello uh, Mr. Steve Cole. Good to see you. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to see you and to talk to you. Yeah, I think that that may be true. Um. Anyway, it's a pleasure. What years were you? Sorry, uh, your voice is uh, breaking. Ambassador, what you were in Washington uh, for some time? What years were you there? I was in New York uh, from two thousand one till two thousand four. I landed from Tehran uh, just three months before nine eleven. So I was consular disarmament with the. Mission to the UN, and, uh, so I had um, more than three years stay in New York. Yeah, of course, I had been across uh, the United States and meeting uh, intelligent people like you. But unfortunately, I missed you there. Yeah, I was at the Washington Post in those years, so um, I must have met some of your colleagues. Who was your uh, DCM at the time? Do you remember? No, not in Washington. In uh, in uh, I was in New York. Uh, my permanent you were in New York. Oh, okay. Was, okay. Mm, yes. Yeah, Malia. Was, was, uh, was Malia in Washington? No, 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 no. It was Munira Kram. Uh -huh. Munira Kram and Shamshad. Yeah. Um, sorry to um, interrupt. Uh, I think we've got everyone here. Welcome to Miss Amna Khan, who's a moderator for this uh, webinar, and also Thank very you. warm welcome to. Uh, Dr. Ijaz Heather, who is going to be one of the esteemed discussants. Um, so, with now that we have everyone with us, we're going to uh, start with the webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, on behalf of Islamabad Policy Research Institute, I welcome you all to our distinguished lecture titled "Afghanistan at the Crossroads: What Went Wrong and How to Move Forward." Uh, today's distinguished lecture will be delivered by Mr. Steve Cole, uh, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. Mr. Steve Cole reports on issues of politics, intelligence, and national security in the U.S. and abroad. He has extensively written about the education of Osama bin Laden, secret negotiations between India and uh, India and Pakistan over Kashmir, 
and the hunt for the Taliban leader, Mullah Muhammad Umar. He was the managing editor of the Washington Post from 1998 to 2005, having earlier been a feature, a feature writer, a foreign correspondent, and an editor there. Uh, in 1990, he shared a Pulitzer Prize with David Weiss for a series of articles about the Securities and Exchange Commission. Dr. Uh, Mr. Cole is the author of several books, including Directorate S, the CIA, and America's uh, Secret Wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, the Bin Ladens, an Arabi uh, Arabian family in the American century, and many uh, others. Thank you for being with us, sir. It's an absolute honor. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Ijaz Heather, a renowned South Asian affairs analyst and ge uh, journalist as they're discussing. He is executive editor at Indus News. He was a Ford Scholar at the Program in Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security at the University of Illinois, and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, Washington, DC. Thank you for being with us, sir. Um, we also have with us um, uh, Ambassador Asif Durrani, who is a senior research fellow at Islamabad Policy Research Institute. Um, and uh, he's also one of the worthy uh, discussants for today's webinar. Uh, today's session will be moderated by Ms. Amna Khan, uh, Director, Center for Afghanistan, Middle East and Africa at the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, where she oversees research and advocacy uh, related work on all facets of the region. Uh, prior to this, she served as a research fellow and a senior research fellow at the IWSI focusing on Afghanistan and the erstwhile uh, FATA region. Uh, over the period of 14 years, she has published extensively on Afghanistan and has presented her research at multiple national and international forums. Uh, before we commence with the discussions, I will now request Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President Dupree, for his welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Omar, and uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Steve Cole, uh, Ijaz Hadar, Amna, Ambassador Durrani, and uh, I'll not uh, encroach any further, even for a uh, uh, few minutes, on this very precious time that we would all like to uh, utilize listening to uh, Steve Cole, picking his brains, and getting enlightened on the unfolding situation in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan uh, is a, a tragedy or a comedy of errors or uh, maybe an opportunity beckoning us all. Only time will tell, but the latest denoma uh, shows that there is both uh, a tinge of uh, worry as well as uh, a lot of satisfaction uh, in the manner that the situation is being um, handled by those who are uh, earlier accused of uh, ham-handed uh, ways of handling things. I'm referring to Taliban, of course. So there's a reality shaping and uh, we would like our uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists to uh, parse open various dimensions of the issue. And the most importantly, what would be the post uh, United States uh, withdrawal scenario? Would uh, we experience a recrudescence of uh, violence in Afghanistan? Or we are going towards a sustainable peace and stability? And what would be the role of international community, especially once the Taliban have evinced a very uh, sure desire for peace and stability, and in many ways appear to have moderated their earlier version? Now, uh, the role of the regional countries and the regional solutions in granting uh, international legitimacy and res resuming the aid to Afghanistan also assumes a lot of importance. So all these issues are uh, the live issues with which the policymakers are grappling. And I'm sure after this discourse, whatever we could glean would come in very handy to uh, forward to the policymaking hubs uh, to which we have uh, uh, greater traction now, uh, courtesy our ex-official patron, Dr. Moeed Yusuf. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to a very, very absorbing discussion. So uh, without much ado, Omar, uh, over to you uh, to commence the proceedings and uh, invite the distinguished panelists and uh, the speaker for their discourse. Over to Thank you. you. 
Thank you so much, sir. Um, I would now hand over the proceedings to the moderator of the session, Ms. Amna Khan. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be moderating the session that too with Dr. Cole and Ijaz Heather. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Cole to give us his uh, remarks and his views on the situation in Afghanistan. Dr. Cole, you have the floor. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll just speak very briefly uh, so that we can jump into the discussion. Um, you know, I think uh, our, our, our colleague, the acting president set it up pretty well. Let's, I'll, I'll confine my initial remarks to the, to the question about the way forward and uh, whether or not, um, you know, stability will be achievable following the events of this summer. Uh, what will, what will, um, be the United States' attitude and, and how will American politics affect uh, US foreign policy as all of this unfolds. Um, you know, I think um, you all understand that the Biden administration made a firm decision to end US military involvement in Afghanistan. This was a personal conviction of the president uh, dating back to his experience as vice president uh, in the early days of the Obama administration where, um, as, as many of you probably understand, and as I wrote about in Directorate S, um, the new president, President Bar uh, Barack Obama, came under pressure from the military to escalate US involvement in Afghanistan, really within the first days of becoming president. Um, and this was at a time when the United States and the world were suffering a a deep recession, the worst since the 1930s. The president's focus was on domestic and economic policies and recovery. And here came these generals with whom he had no real prior experience telling him he needed to go big in Afghanistan, first to secure the 2009 election and then to uh, pursue a counterinsurgency strategy with more uh, NATO troops. Now, the president was skeptical, but his vice president, Joe Biden, was even more skeptical. Um, he felt that the military was taking advantage of the president, that they were selling him um, uh, a bunch of um, uh, you know, ideas about military success that had no evidentiary basis. And he, he uh, though he respected the way the president handled it, um, he recommended that the president go small, um, that, it, that the president concentrate on counterterrorism as the principal US interest in the war and not pursue counterinsurgency. And, and he, his advice was turned aside. Uh, he essentially lost the argument in the cabinet, in the war cabinet. And I, you know, I spoke with him at that time a couple of times, uh, you know, along with others. And you could sense that he was frustrated. Um, one thing that Joe Biden always understood was that American public opinion had turned against the war, that the clock was ticking on American tolerance of the expense and the, and the loss of life uh, that was unfolding in Afghanistan. And um, he felt that the United States should start to make a, um, an exit, a managed exit, uh, before it lost control of the politics of the, of the war as well. That was another factor, I think, in his thinking. So when he became president and he inherited this negotiation from Doha, uh, again, in similar circumstances in the sense that he came in uh, as President Obama did in the midst of a domestic crisis, really a global crisis, uh, the pandemic and the economic disruptions associated with the pandemic. He had a big agenda domestically for the United States, just as President Obama had uh, you know, infrastructure investments and massive uh, stimulus to the domestic economy. And the last thing he wanted was to um, have Afghanistan interfere with uh, the urgent matters that he thought the United States should attend to. So uh, he inherited, as you all know, he inherited this negotiation with a hard deadline attached to it. And um, when he looked at the alternatives, um, he realized that if he didn't figure out a way to essentially honor the deal that the Trump administration had made with the Taliban, that he would have to escalate the combat with the Taliban in all likelihood, and that there was no certain outcome of that, uh, but there were certain costs. Uh, the United States would again uh, be more active in, in combat, there would be bloodshed involving American soldiers and, uh, and no clear path out. So he made this uh, 
uh, decision that uh, in the United States is now coming under very heavy criticism, including from the Democratic Party, as being hasty and um, lacking in, in planning. But it was a decision that he made out of longstanding and deep personal conviction. Now, um, you know, as the events have unfolded and, and, you know, the United States intelligence community advised him he had a year or two, um, the decent interval that Kissinger spoke of in Vietnam, uh, that before uh, Kabul would be threatened. Um, I remember when uh, the president announced his decision, uh, just thinking back on the history of predictions about uh, Afghanistan and, and uh, these kinds of guerrilla wars, uh, going back to uh, some of you may recall in 1988 and 89, after the Soviet uh, troops withdrew, there were predictions that Kabul, uh, then governed by President Najibullah, uh, the post-Soviet government of Afghanistan, there were predictions that it would fall in 30 days or 60 days. Well, it, it took three years. <laughs> and uh, there've been many other predictions about how events would unfold in Afghanistan offered by uh, the CIA, and for that matter, um, allies in Pakistan's establishment as well um, that have been proved wrong. So my feeling was, I don't know what's going to unfold, but I'll bet you that the predictions will be wrong um, because they always have been. And this time they were wrong uh, by failing to see how rapidly events would unfold. Now, um, the United States and Pakistan shared goals in these negotiations in Doha. The goals were uh, included um, uh, common interests in counterterrorism in Afghanistan to prevent um, transnational terrorist groups from incubating in Afghanistan um, any more than they already do. Um, the TTP is a threat to Pakistan, um, Al Qaeda and some of its elements also. Uh, the Islamic State is obviously a threat uh, to the United States. And uh, there was a long history in the Doha process of trying to uh, align with the Taliban around a common agenda of counterterrorism. Um, I think uh, that will certainly be one of the Biden administration's top priorities with the new Taliban government. Um, it will be pursued in, uh, with an attitude of, of, of considerable skepticism in the United States Congress about the Taliban's willingness and ability to deliver on a counterterrorism agenda. Uh, and you know we're, we're, we're right now in the fog of war. Th events are happening so quickly in Afghanistan, it's very difficult to get a grip on what is really happening, but we do get credible reports, for example, that the prisons are being emptied as the Taliban come into Kabul and that TTP, TTP leaders and uh, militants are among those being released. Uh, presumably that is not something that Pakistan would like to see. Um, we also see that uh, ISK leaders have been released in these kind of throwing the prison doors open moments that have occurred. And that's certainly not something the United States wants to see happen. So what the Taliban, um, I'm not thinking about the immediate next few weeks, but thinking about the next six to 12 months, what, the, what will the Taliban do to uh, cooperate uh, on, on this counterterrorism agenda? I think that is probably the most important question um, in United States policymaking and politics. There is going to be an enormous amount of attention um, in the American media and in Congress about the human rights conditions in Afghanistan following Taliban rule, about women's access to work and education. Um, and, the United, and the Biden administration will be paying attention to those matters. But this is a president whose decision-making about Afghanistan has been almost entirely located in counterterrorism objectives. And so if the Taliban, um, are to be measured by any one thing that guides uh, certainly the White House's decision making, I think that's where it will be. So let me stop there and, and I'm sure there's so much more we could talk about, but um, give you uh, something to, to chew on. All right, yeah, for sure. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. Now, before I get to uh, Ijaz Heather, I believe Ambassador Durrani um, has another commitment. So he has requested to be given the floor uh, before you Ijaz. So Ambassador Durrani. Uh, thank you, Amna. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Steve. Uh, it's uh, good to hear your uh, views and especially you have touched uh, a very sensitive issue with regard to counterterrorism uh, efforts of uh, President Joe Biden. Am I audible? Yes. Right. 
So uh, my uh, observation in this regard would be that uh, uh, while Taliban uh, are a reality now, they are now in control of the country except for Panjshir Valley. And uh, uh, by and large, this uh, change has been peaceful. And uh, at the same time, uh, yes, there have been some uh, incidents uh, of lawlessness, uh, but uh, you can see that uh, Kabul um, uh, is almost peaceful. Uh, you don't see, except for the, the, the airport area where the outer parameters are being controlled by the Taliban. Uh, my question in this regard would be to you, uh, Steve, that uh, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, Mr. Biden's administration expects that Taliban should be uh, part of the counterterrorism effort uh, in uh, Afghanistan. And mind you, uh, these uh, ISK, in fact, uh, uh, took roots uh, under the American watch. Uh, almost 2014 onwards, because it was the United States which was in charge of the security and they were running the affairs in Afghanistan. Uh, well, yes, Mr. Ghani was also there, but we know uh, what uh, uh, kind of uh, respect Mr. Ghani enjoyed in his own system, uh, so much so that uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, President um, Trump uh, preferred Taliban to discuss uh, about the withdrawal of American troops over Ashraf Ghani, and he was kept on the sidelines. And probably that was also one of the reasons that the Afghan forces met down so quickly because they had no incentive and there was nothing to defend about. Because if the president was discredited, his entire political force was discredited, so nothing was left for him. And then we have seen the result that in Kabul, uh, even uh, the president, he left in a half and he left in such a hurry that even the uh, security forces, they also melted down and Taliban had to perforce enter Kabul while they were under instructions not to enter Kabul. So my question here is that on one hand, the United States would expect the Taliban to be partners in counterterrorism. But on the other hand, they are in a, in a, they are under sanctions. Sanctions. Why I say this is that uh, 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 America has frozen almost nine billion dollars of Afghan central bank reserves, and uh, they have uh, IMF has also frozen almost four hundred sixty million dollars of uh, their share, which was to be uh, dispersed uh, to Afghanistan. So uh, uh, these kind of things are creating more confusion. And, uh, and to expect that then Taliban would be delivering, I don't think it is possible. And more importantly, um, a humanitarian crisis is looming uh, on the horizon. Uh, and even World Food Program uh, has uh, apprehended that by mid-September, they, uh, they could face a huge uh, food crisis in Afghanistan if uh, immediate measures are not taken. So here at the same time, we are facing with how to tackle with uh, the counterterrorism issue. And on the other hand, there's a humanitarian crisis which is looming large over the horizon. So uh, I wanted to pick up your brains that how you think that this is going to go about and how the meeting of minds would take place uh, with regard to the Taliban, whether they will uh, enjoy only the de facto recognition or they'll have the de jure re re recognition as well from the United States and its allies. Over to you, Steve. Well, they're good, they're good questions. I mean, I think uh, what, I, what I feel um, most able to describe is what the policymaking and political reality is in uh, the United States and to some extent also in Europe, countries like Germany, France, um, and the UK that, um, you know, have their own uh, uh, evacuation efforts underway and their own channels to the Taliban as well. Um, you know, I think, uh, I hear your question about sanctions and I understand why the Taliban uh, might prioritize uh, sanctions relief and negotiations just as they successfully prioritized uh, prisoner releases. Um, but, uh, I think the reality of uh, uh, the situation is that 
and this, you know, the Taliban may feel this is entirely unfair, but the reality is that um, they're going to need to demonstrate through their sustained action um, a commitment to counterterrorism that's recognized by Berlin, Paris, London, and Washington as credible and meaningful. And, um, you know, there was uh, an element of the February 2020 deal um, in which uh, counterterrorism was, you know, an important part, particularly in relation to Al Qaeda. And the UN's own assessment is that, you know, important elements of Al Qaeda are present in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, now that the Taliban control 98 or 6 percent of the country, but for the Panjshir Valley, um, you know, are they willing to demonstrate um, that they're going to, to respond to these um, uh, pockets of transnational uh, listed terrorist elements on their own soil? And you know, if the if the Taliban's position is we're not going to do anything until you give us sanctions relief, then I'm afraid we're going to start back into one of those downward cycles. This is just my analysis. I'm not a policymaker. I'm just telling you what I think is going to happen. Uh, we're going to start back in one of those stalemates and downward cycles in which the Taliban take the position that, well, you haven't given us enough. And then um, a very skeptical public in the United States and in uh, these European countries is going to say, oh, it's just the same old Taliban. Let's not fall for this again. Uh, without demonstrated change, I think we're going to get back into that sanction cycle that is uh, all too familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. All right. Um, Jazz Heather, would you like to make your comments? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, before anything else, much as I like the sound of doctor, unfortunately, I'm not one, so I, I thought I'll, I'll put that on the table. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Dean Steve Gore uh, for his comments. Uh, obviously, when uh, we're going to discuss this further, there will be uh, you know, discussion of uh, what he said about Joe Biden's being skeptical even back in 2008. And as he mentioned, he has already uh, the great details about those uh, meetings in his book, Directorate S. I just want to flag uh, a few points with reference to Pakistan's position. And Pakistan's position since the Bonn Conference and subsequent series of agreements, which is back in December 2001, uh, has been grounded in two arguments. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, that there's no military solution to the Afghanistan problem. And second, that Taliban, and at that time, at the Bonn conference time, it was not just about the Taliban, but, uh, of course, elements that the Taliban represented. And the argument was that they have a constituency, and that constituency uh, must be represented in the political process in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, the, the provisional government that was to come into place and, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, Pakistan's position on both these counts was ignored. But it's interesting that Islamabad has remained consistent uh, through all the ups and downs of the war in that country. And ironically, uh, even when uh, Pakistan was capturing Taliban leaders and handing them over to the U.S. And we know that Francis Wendell, for instance, at that time, uh, before he was removed and replaced by Lakhzad Brahimi, was very clear about the fact that, uh, you know, what was happening on the ground with reference to uh, the Northern Alliance uh, was something that should not, uh, the capture of territory should not in and of itself, uh, you know, be reflected in the incoming uh, political dispensation. But he was ignored, he was removed. Brahimi uh, was more amenable to uh, the U.S. position, but then in 2004, and his interview was on record, uh, he talked about not including uh, some of the constituencies as the original sin, with reference to you know the regrouping and 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 the uh, the start of the insurgency. And it is from this position that Pakistan facilitated the U.S. deal. And it is also from this position that it had been trying to convince the Taliban, I mean, that's, that's free Kabul, fall of Kabul, uh, to make the intra-Afghan dialogue work and return to Kabul through a power-sharing arrangement that 
has international back. But at that time, Ashraf Ghani was there, uh, the perfect rationale of Pakistan's position notwithstanding, it faced two problems. And this is again a matter of record. Ghani's government was consistently negative towards Pakistan. And the Taliban refused to be dictated on how to go about dealing with Ghani. And now we know what their strategy was. And of course, we can you know, discuss that further. But, but at that time, uh, no one really knew what they were up to. There were you know, uh, conjectures and speculation. But they were operating uh, on, uh, on a grand strategy with reference to how to deal with Ghani. A further problem, which has, uh, as we all know, increasingly been acknowledged by Pakistani officials and analysts, is that Pakistan's influence with the Taliban has reached a ceiling. Taliban also know that short of using coercion, Pakistan cannot do any more. So before the fall of Kabul, Pakistan had made clear to the US, its allies, and also the Ghani government, that it will not and it cannot use force against the Taliban because that would make it lose whatever little capital it retained with that move. And frankly, later events have proved that that was a good call. Now, this was, of course, as I said before, the fall of Kabul. Now, what's happening on the ground, Pakistan is closely monitoring the situation. Uh, despite Taliban victories, the situation, as we know, remains fluid. And there are multiple actors that are still contesting for political space. Uh, Pakistan has to watch the behavior of Taliban as well as how the Panjshiri resistance pans out. Now, uh, these are early days. The signals from the Taliban leadership are better than the last time they were in Kabul. Uh, but the statements are still vague. Uh, for instance, while Taliban leaders are negotiating with the transition council and are in contact with former President Hamad Karzai, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, and Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, there are other stakeholders who are not part of these talks. And last Tuesday, I spoke with Ahmed Wali Masood. Uh, he had just arrived in Paris from Pakistan. And he told me that these consultations are without an acceptable framework of talks, which can lead to a broad-based inclusive government. Uh, another issue which uh, the Steve Cole mentioned uh, Taliban spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid stated that women can be part of the workforce, but they must abide by the rules of Sharia. This is again a vague statement because Sharia is not codified, and different schools have different interpretations of how it works. We all know that in the previous incarnation, Taliban's idea of women's place was extremely regressive. They need to explain what their interpretation of Sharia this time around is. There's also truth in the assertion that this is not the 90s in the last 20 years for all the mistakes made by the US and its allies. have seen Afghan women in the urban centers play a significant role in the social, economic, and political spheres of that country. Then we have the issue of media freedom. Mujahid spoke about Taliban's idea of how the media should work. He said Taliban want all media outlets to continue their activities, but they have three suggestions. No broadcast should contradict Islamic values, reports should be impartial, and no one should broadcast anything that goes against the national interest. <laughs> Once again, uh, as is clear, all these categories are vague and depend on how the Taliban interpret Islamic values, what they would consider impartial, and how they would define nationalism. So these are obvious concerns going forward. Uh, there is also, as I said, the issue of resistance, uh, notably forces loyal to Ahmed Masood. They may or may not be able to do much since they are surrounded, but the balance in the Northeast and Northwest, which are respectively heavy Tajik and Uzbek areas, remains tenuous. The Taliban strategy to take and control those provinces was frankly brilliant, but those gains can as easily be lost. Uh, it's, of course, a separate topic. Uh, uh, Ambassador Durrani has also mentioned it to discuss how and why the ANDSF capitulated. But what I think is important to note is that Taliban capture of the territory, for the most part, was political rather than military. The gains have not been the result of a direct contest of arms, except in some places like Shevagan and Iraq and, and a few other places. So essentially, what I'm arguing is that what can be or what could be gained through a political and legitimacy contest can also be lost. 
It's important to note that uh, Taliban legitimacy has more to do with the lack of faith in Ghani's leadership and government than any capital that, frankly, inheres in the movement itself. So, uh, in, a, in an ironic twist, I, I would suggest that the Taliban are now in the same position as the U.S. and the Ghani government. So, gaining territory is a necessary but not sufficient condition. The U.S. lost the contest when it got involved in stabilization operations and stitching a government that could never deliver. So stability remains a challenge. Retaining legitimacy, acquiring international recognition is crucial for the Taliban. Money is another issue. Uh, again, um, Ambassador uh, Durrani talked about it. Steve Cole responded uh, by, by uh, you know, looking at the situation in terms of uh, the cash 22 that there is. But it's interesting that, uh, <laughs> excuse me, that Ajmal Ahmadi, who's the former head of Afghanistan Central Bank, uh, wrote uh, an op-ed in Financial Times. This was, I think, on 25th August. And he argued that the Taliban were able to quickly take control of the territory. That now they must show if they can govern. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, with monies. Uh, you know, the freezing of 9 billion of foreign reserves. Uh, the import coverage, according to him, dropped from more than 15 months to only two days. Uh, international aid flows are likewise expected to decline. Uh, Germany has announced a suspension of 300 million in aid. Uh, IMF has suspended its $40 million uh, SDR allocation and so on. The third issue is retaining and stabilizing the tenuous balance, especially in the non pashtun areas, which I referred to. So this is essentially the lay of the land as things stand, in which Pakistan has to operate. Uh, we are still trying to get the players in Afghanistan to agree to a provisional setup uh, that can work out a future constitutional arrangement. But again, Pakistan's role is that of a facilitator only. Ultimately, it's up to the Afghans to do that. Uh, as we know, uh, the foreign minister is on a four-nation tour, so Pakistan remains actively involved diplomatically to get a regional consensus on joint actions, especially with China, but also with Russia, Iran, and the Central Asian states. But then Pakistan is not the only actor in the region. So it has to contend with various other actors, including, I must put this on the table, contend with Indian activities in Afghanistan. Um, and then there are other regional and extra-regional actors, and, and it's not necessary that their objectives and interests uh, may sync with Pakistan. Then there is the other big concern, and it's an existential security threat, is the presence of Daesh, which is a violent spoiler, uh, a regroup TTP, uh, IMU, uh, ETIM, Al Qaeda, and other sundry freelancers. And this is something which Pakistan obviously uh, has to deal with. And finally, uh, I would think that Pakistan should simultaneously prepare for a failure of diplomatic efforts and Consequent to that, heightened violence in Afghanistan. And that involves two major spillovers, refugee inflow and cross-border terrorism. But we can discuss those further as we proceed. Thank you, uh, Ijaz, for those comments. Um, so I have a number of questions coming in, but I'd like to um, begin the discussion by referring to something that you said, Dr. Cole. You said, and if I heard you correctly, that Pakistan and the US had shared goals in Afghanistan. But I think many in Pakistan see that as a contradiction, particularly when it comes to Pakistan always being made that very convenient scapegoat, um, you know, when it comes to the failures in Afghanistan. And I think time and again, one has to realize that it's a shared responsibility. And I will come back to what Jaz Heather also said, that I think Pakistan's policy may not have been consistent on other issues, but I think on Afghanistan, it's been pretty consistent when it comes to having, you know, no military solution and including the Afghan Taliban, you know, as a major stakeholder. Um, it's just another matter that it's taken the international community more than 20 years to realize this. Um, so isn't it slightly unfair for the Americans and then of course the Afghans also jump on the bandwagon when they continuously put all the onus on Pakistan? Uh, I'd like to have your views on that, if we could start the discussion from there. Well, look, I mean, there's plenty of blame to go around, and I'm not sure that I think it's that 
helpful to kind of unpack all of the sources of unfairness in the discourse around Afghanistan. I mean, you know, the United States also has its grievances about Pakistan's conduct, the uh, sanctuary that the Taliban enjoyed over a long period of time, even though many people like myself understand the complexities of it, understand the uh, violence and insecurity that Pakistan itself suffered from, say, 2007 to 2014 as a result of the spillover of war and and understand that the Taliban are not um, best understood as, you know, sort of puppets to the Pakistan's uh, strings. But, you know, nonetheless, there is an enormous amount of grievance in the United States towards uh, Pakistan's role in all of this. And I understand very well that there is at least as much, if not more grievance in Pakistan <laughs> toward the American kind of arrogance and refusal to consider uh, some of the arguments that Pakistan put forward about political negotiations and settlements. On the question of no military, and by the way, I loved Ijaz's presentation. I found myself nodding along with quite a lot of what he had to say. Um, so I think, you know, analytically, um, I, I think we've got now here in this discussion a pretty good, pretty good ground to talk about uh, things from, but on this question of no military solution, I mean, yes, it's true that, you know, Pakistan's uh, leaders advise the United States against uh, their intervention, their invasion uh, in October of 2001. Um, and uh, then once it was quickly successful, advised, um, you know, advocated for the Taliban's inclusion in uh, post-Taliban uh, constitutional politics and that the Bush administration rejected that instead failed to draw a distinction between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda shipped Taliban off to Guantanamo. I certainly think that was, um, you know, a, a mistake and um, a, an enormous missed opportunity. If there was ever a time the United States might have gotten things um, on a more stable path after the, after the Emirates fall, after the Taliban's fall, um, that was probably the place. And instead they took a you know, a kind of uh, everyone is, uh, you know, there were no shades of gray in their approach to the relationship between uh, the Taliban and the future of Afghanistan. They made it clear to the Taliban that if you want a place in Afghanistan's future, you're gonna have to fight for it. So that's what the Taliban did. And anyway, that's history. On this question of no military solutions, I mean, you know, let's bear in mind that the reason uh, everybody was in though was that it was, it was formal American policy after about 2000, <laughs> 12, certainly President Obama's conviction in his second term that there was no way to win the war militarily, that there was no military solution, that, that they were on a glide path to a political settlement. Uh, and their policy was to start to negotiate. So they, you know, the Obama administration uh, reached out to the Taliban starting in 2010. Um, and it proved to be a very difficult negotiation. Pakistan was reluctant to get involved. I understand why they didn't want to be on the hook as the Taliban's agent and the Taliban didn't really want them to act as their agent either. And uh, so, you know, Pakistan was cautious, trying to protect its own security. That was at a time when, when Pakistan had its hands full with um, domestic uh, terrorism. And, and so, but, but the point is that the United States and Pakistan have both actually been pursuing um, political solutions since 2010. Um, the, there's a, the Americans introduced the, this, this phrase, fight and talk. And I remember in Director at S, I described a conversation between you know, Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, General Kiani in which Hillary Clinton acknowledged and said, you know, we know you don't like the idea of fight and talk. You would, you would rather just move on to the talk, but we believe in fight and talk. We think it's necessary. And the, I was reminded of it recently because when you think about the Taliban strategy over the last two years, that's what they did too. They fought and talked. And, um, but the US engagement at Doha, like the Pakistani one, was premised on the pursuit of reduced violence, a transition from war to politics, and a settlement that would stabilize the country. And it failed. Uh, it failed for you know, a whole bunch of reasons that I think scholars and journalists will be unpacking for a while. Um, I don't think it was a good negotiation. I don't think it was plausible uh, to exclude the Afghan government to the extent that it was. The Americans were rushing to the exit. Uh, even their European uh, allies who were no enthusiasts of the war in Afghanistan thought the Americans were rushing to the exits. 
uh, and destabilizing things through their through their hasty negotiations. Um, you know, I'm sure Pakistan had its own take about all of that. But here we are, the, the vision of a, of a plural, politically plural Afghanistan uh, achieved through political compromise is gone. So it'll have to be reconstructed from um, a starting point of, of almost total Taliban control of the country. And uh, the last thing I would say, um, you know, and Ijaz, I'd be interested in what you think about this. Um, the Taliban uh, clearly have not taken advice um, from anybody uh, very consistently. They have their own views about, about what they're trying to achieve. And, um, and they have not, um, in these negotiations, demonstrated or even articulated a vision of power sharing and pluralism in, Af in Afghanistan that I think any Afghan that I know uh, and I'm not talking about Panjshiris. I'm talking about people who want peace and stability. You know, uh, any Afghan finds credible. Um, they would have to demonstrate through compromise and power sharing that they really mean to include um, others in in the future of Afghanistan's government. And as you well understand, you know. To the extent that they fail to demonstrate good faith on counterterrorism, they're going to lose the West. To the extent they fail to demonstrate um, in inclusiveness and tolerance towards the Hazara communities, towards, uh, towards their opponents, even their diehard op opponents now gathering under arms in the Panjshir Valley, to the extent that they uh, don't compromise with the likes of Hamid Karzai and, uh, and Abdullah Abdullah who have, you know, offered in good faith to try to ex expand the political coalition that the Taliban controls. If they fail to do all of those things, what's going to be the result? I think Ijaz referred to it. They're going to get more resistance. They're going to get more armed resistance and that armed resistance will increasingly invite outside participation just as it has always done in the past. So, you know, if the Panjiris uh, and, their, and their allies get traction and and the Taliban are seen to be harsh and um, uncompromising in their treatment of, of Bamiyan, uh, you know, there are going to be regional and international powers that are going to be tempted to come in and support that resistance. So the clock is ticking on this demonstration project, I think. Uh, you know, even if the Taliban roll into the Panjshir and vanquish this, this last pocket of resistance, the equation is still going to be the same because if they fail to govern inclusively, resistance will recur and it will attract international support over time. And that means for, from Pakistan's perspective, an unstable and violent Afghanistan with the two spillover dangers that Ijaz correctly, I think, identified refugees and cross-border violence or terrorism. Okay, before I get Ijaz's views, now you've said, you know, they have to demonstrate this change. A, this is, in my understanding, a transition period. Uh, and, you know, the group has been extensively engaging with other major political, uh, you know, actors within Afghanistan, including the ones you've mentioned, Ahmed Karzai, Hikmat Yar, and in fact, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah. But what is the time frame do you think the Americans are willing to give the Taliban to demonstrate this change? Because this is a transition period and they haven't declared a government. And I think they know that the regional countries have clearly said there will be real recognition of an Afghan government. It has to be inclusive. So how does that pan out then? I mean, it's a good question. I, don't, I think the Biden administration is in such a crisis management uh, phase right now that they probably haven't given much thought to that, uh, to that process. You know, it's, it's really a post Doha process. I don't even know where Doha will figure in it. Um, you know, who's gonna build a new architecture um, and how, how will the confidence building evolve? Uh, so I, you know, look, the, the Biden administration, um, so far as I can uh, think it through and, and from what I understand from talking to people, they don't really have a plan B. Um, so uh, I imagine they will be patient. I, I do see them um, taking some pains, uh, though it may not be quite so visible in, the, in this crisis atmosphere, taking some pains to acknowledge the Taliban's cooperation around the airport um, you know, around uh, uh, efforts to evacuate, 
you know, the Qataris have been um, constructive in getting people out. So, you know, this this kind of alliance of negotiators that that didn't achieve much except confidence in one another in Doha, uh, they, they've survived and they've actually helped uh, make things uh, a little bit you know, better in, a, in an appalling and terrible situation in Kabul. And so I, the fact that Bill Burns flew out to talk to the Taliban, the fact that mm -hmm. uh, Biden calls out Taliban cooperation, even though it's politically you know, kind of unpopular to do so in his explanations for what the United States is trying to do, to me, it's an indication of some patience. Uh, what they would really like to do is get this evacuation completed. Um, they would really like to see that the people they are going to leave behind, tens of thousands of people, and I know you know, uh, all of you on this, just how heartbreaking it is for those of us who have worked in Afghanistan to see this middle-class generation that was, you know, that grew up in the cities after 2001, women, rights defenders, journalists, think tankers, NGOs, humanitarian workers. I mean, there was no generation like this in the history of Afghanistan. And, you know, and, and all of us who love Pakistan and, and urban Pakistan and understand the Pakistani middle class, like this was the first version of that in Afghanistan, you know, and, and to see it wiped away and thousands of those people are gonna be left behind. So how is the Taliban really going to treat them? What is going to happen to them? Are they all going to become refugees? Are some of them going to be incorporated? You know, women are already being ordered off the airwaves. So, so they're not going to be broadcasters and anchors and street reporters anymore. Um, but what's going to happen, uh, you know, in the in the workplace, in in the ministries? Uh, someone circulated a text today that that the Minister of Information and Culture said, uh, everybody's welcome back to office, except all women should stay home. Um, now, is this really going to be the new Taliban? Because if that's what unfolds over the next three months, then never mind the, you know, sort of power broker to power broker conversations with Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah. It's going to be very difficult to persuade Germany uh, and France and the UK to come back in if inclusiveness is not social as well as political. Interesting you say that because the other day, in fact, the Taliban did have a meeting with the previous um, education minister, Hamida Rangini, uh, who was Ashraf Ghani's education minister. And she had a meeting with the Taliban where they are, I think, overlooking, uh, you know, just changing the curriculum or whatnot. So I don't know, that's debatable. Uh, again, Ijaz, forgive me, but there are a lot of questions towards uh, Dr. Cole and they are related. So I will come back to you. But so um, is the US then still interested in brokering or overseeing the formation of this inclusive political setup that we keep on hearing about? Because you say in essence that the Doha process is really dead, is it at all? And if it is, then do the Americans not have a responsibility? Because remember when Biden came into power, he said that he was going to review the process and I don't think anybody anticipated uh, such an irresponsible review, if I may say. I mean, no, I, I look, I, I think it was a, uh, a terrible, uh, review and decision, and um, it's had devastating consequences. The consequences were predictable. The timeline might not have been predictable, but the consequences certainly were. Um, look, I, it's in the interests of the United States uh, to support efforts to stabilize Afghanistan through inclusive politics. And there will be debate in the American political system about um, whether to accept a Taliban government or how much to accept a Taliban government, what level of demonstrated good faith on counterterrorism and power sharing is necessary. You know, as you know, uh, all of you know who uh, or know the United States, uh, we never are outside of an election cycle. <laughs> uh, we're always in an election mm -hmm. cycle and, and our politics is heavily polarized now, uh, even in foreign policy where it used to be um, less so. And so already the Republican party is looking to um, exploit the errors of the Biden administration in Afghanistan to, um, to start a narrative about uh, the Biden administration's failures. Um, abroad and if the Biden administration, so the Biden administration will be constrained by domestic politics and how far it, it gets out in front in trying <laughs> to uh, support the Taliban in, in um, you know, in its new rule. But if, um, if there's a new framework for power sharing talks and, and 
political inclusion. And if the Taliban make meaningful decisions to participate and to include um, uh, you know, former opponents um, in, in that, uh, Europeans will be looking to see that happen. The Europeans are, I think, it's a little bit like Iran during the Trump uh, administration. Uh, you know, the Europeans are, are maybe in front of the Americans now on this question of post uh, Doha politics in Afghanistan, because they have the most acute interest in uh, preventing a failure uh, in the next year or two, because the refugee flow will hit them just as it will hit you. And, they, and every one of those governments knows how destabilizing that will be. I mean, the French are going into a, an election in which the hard right is the issue. Uh, you can see Macron trying to have it both ways already. He's talking about protecting human rights defenders and women in Afghanistan. At the same time, he's saying no refugees are going to come here. Uh, so, you know, it's it's uh, the Europeans who are going to want to pursue any path that is truly stabilizing. And if that includes in power sharing, um, then I think the Biden administration will support them. I don't see the Biden administration waving the flag and coming in and saying, okay, we got this. <laughs> they're not, that's, that's not, that's not what's going to unfold. Um, they're going to be bruised and they're going to want to change the subject. They're not going to want to talk about Afghanistan politically in the United States for the next four years. Um, it's only the Republicans who are going to want to talk about it. Okay. It just let me bring you in now. Yeah, there's, there's a lot on the table. Uh, excellent analysis uh, by Steve Cole, but one doesn't expect any less from him, obviously, uh, given um, his experience, his, his expertise, and uh, the detailed books that he has written. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to get into this uh, blame game. Uh, Steve rightly said there's much blame to go around. Uh, but just to set the record straight, uh, Pakistan's approach to the U.S. invasion uh, has had three phases. The first phase was from 2001 to 2004. And this was a phase in which, uh, as, we, uh, as we might recall, uh, despite then President Musharraf's disappointment uh, at the fact that uh, President Bush could not keep his promise with reference to uh, not allowing the Northern Alliance to get into Kabul uh, by force. Also that, you know, the Taliban constituencies were not included in the bond process, yet Pakistan was a partner in uh, U.S. counterterrorism uh, uh, efforts. Uh, there were U.S. Uh, CIA and other relevant uh, operatives in Pakistan working with Pakistani intelligence agencies. A number of Al-Qaeda activists were uh, nabbed, uh, handed over to the U.S. Uh, ditto for Taliban leaders. I mean, can you imagine Mullah Brother, who's now heading this entire thing politically, uh, remained in Pakistani custody for many, many years? So I'm not sure he's very fond of us. So, so my point is that uh, it was after 2004 that a number of other things began to happen, and I, I don't have to go into uh, the details of that that Pakistan decided to shift its policy. I have, since I'm not an official, I'm a journalist, uh, you know, I've, I've always been somewhat struck by uh, the, the apology that Pakistanis have generally been extending, especially officials with reference to Taliban sanctuaries. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, the issue is very complex. This uh, line, uh, which, the, which the Afghans continue to call the Iran line, even though it's an internationally recognized border. This is this is porous. In 2005, when Musharraf uh, said that we're going to sense it and mine it, uh, there was a lot of hue and cry. Karzai himself was opposed to it. On the one hand, they wanted Pakistan to ensure no one crosses over to the west. On the other hand, they were not prepared to accept biometrics and visas and the rest of it. So it was a pretty complex situation. And you would recall that when we uh, put biometrics in Chaman, there was a Afghan mob that, that came and attacked and, you know, <laughs> vandalized those biometric machines and, and other, you know, uh, visa-issuing processes. Uh, then, of course, the issue of the tribes on both sides. But the most important thing, when we uh, started doing the military operations, 
and this is something I, I base on my uh, conversations with uh, a former COS General Kiani. General Kiani told General Petraeus also and by Chris Lowe, look, we are operating in the Northwest and you're operating in the Southeast. This is going to become a revolving door. People will enter Pakistani territory. And when we operate, these guys are going to enter the Afghan territory. You need to have blocking forces on the other side in order for us to make this work properly. But that did not work out. Kiani also had other ideas, and I don't have to mention that because Steve has mentioned uh, Kiani 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, <laughs> and his directorate test. So, you know, that, that part of the, the debate is well known. So I think there were these divergences. And then, of course, if you look at it in a realist framework, Pakistan had to then fend for itself. It had its own interests that continue to become divergent from the US interests. It also had concerns uh, with reference to India. It had concerns with reference to uh, first Hamad Karzai government and later Ghani government with reference to this whole idea. It was a throwback and we all know this is a red rag to the bull with reference to greater Pashtunistan and non-recognition of Durand line and the rest of it. And one of the deepest ironies is that this non-recognition of Durand line has been the central problem between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And, and no one seems to recognize Ghani in the, in the twilight days of his rule, if you recall, went to host to inaugurate the host airport. And one of the things that he said there was, I want to tell my Taliban brethren that if they come to power, they should not recognize the Durand line. So this irredentism uh, is something that seems to be ingrained in the, in the Afghan political and other elites. Amrullah Saleh, first vice president, actually tweeted saying that Peshawar used to be the summer capital of Afghanistan. And of all the people, it was uh, uh, Secretary Wells who responded by tweeting back and saying this irredentism is not going to work and you know you need to you know get off it. So my point is that uh, there have been mistakes on all sides and uh, I think moving forward as Steve said uh, his question to me with reference to how the Taliban are likely to behave uh, frankly it's an open question. Uh, the signals right now with reference for instance to uh, the Hazaras the Taliban, uh, 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 de Taliban delegation went to one of the Imam Bargas in Kabul. Um, there was a video clip of that. It was tweeted also. And they, they mentioned that, uh, you know, everyone is free to, uh, to observe their rites and rituals. Then, of course, uh, as far as the uh, female anchors are concerned, we have video clips of anchors on Solo and other uh, actually interviewing Taliban leaders. Uh, but as I said, these are early days. I must also uh, add that, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, I had Dr. Ilhan Niaz, who is, you know, is one of our eminent young historians. He was on my program. And when I asked him this, he had something interesting to say. He said, look, the ideological movements, whether they are on the right or left, they, when they are in the process of consolidation, they might signal moderation. Because that is the time when they want to pull everyone in. That is the time when they want to have some kind of, uh, after having the de facto, uh, you know, uh, uh, occupation or, or, you know, retaking of the government. They, they want to have de jure recognition. So this is the consolidation phase. And in the consolidation phase, they are going to send out all the right signals. But once they have consolidated, Historically speaking, once they have consolidated, then they will always fall back on their ideology and sometimes the worst and the, you know, sort of swearest, uh, hardcore aspects of that ideology. So this is an open question. However, uh, as I look at it, Taliban uh, have, 
a major problem in terms of stabilization operation. Uh, what we are witnessing currently uh, is something which, as I have mentioned, is very tenuous. Uh, now, there are two scenarios. Let me be more specific. There are two scenarios. One is that the Panjshiri say, well, you know, no, we are going to resist. And the Taliban move in and they crush that uh, uprising or resistance. That still will have a major impact in the Tajik and Uzbek areas. If, on the other hand, the Taliban have initial setbacks uh, in the field, that will have a domino impact on other local uprisings. So both ways, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a tricky situation for the Taliban, and therefore they need to resolve it, uh, you know, short of using force. And I think that is where the idea of a broad-based inclusive government uh, uh, must come in. Now, you might recall, the, you know, this is about a month ago. In fact, this is before the fall of Kabul. Sohail Shaheen was asked this question and he said, look, uh, the centralization, monopolization formula has not worked in Afghanistan in the past. It's not going to work in the future. And we are not going to go, uh, you know, uh, through a failed form. Now, historically, that is correct. I mean, if, if you take modern Afghanistan and start with uh, Amanullah Khan, uh, the entire civil war uh, basically began because of Amanullah Khan's modernization reforms program. And, and the countryside rose up in revolt, and then the whole uh, thing of the Bacha Sakayo and the rest, and then he had to abdicate. You see the same kind of thing during Zahir Shah's uh, relatively calm and quiet uh, three decades of rule, there were these small uprisings, but he was deaf in negotiating uh, these settlements. You see this during President Daoud's regime. You see this in the, in the PDP. Now, what was PDP here trying to do? Almost the same kind of thing which the US and its allies have tried to do, to modernize Afghanistan. But how do you move that modernization from urban centers to the countryside. And that's an issue uh, which uh, remains problematic even today. The PDPA, uh, you know, except for the communist ideology, it was about, you know, women's liberation, universal education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Same kind of thing, but it didn't work out. And, you know, we all know that uh, the US was at that time on the side of the Mujahideen. Uh, but these people retain their ideology. Now, for me, the issue really boils down to how they will juxtapose the compulsions of ideology with the compulsions of pragmatism. And which side of complexity will they fall? And that is something which I, I, I cannot really predict, which is why in my presentation I said, after everything, all the diplomatic capital that we have we, you know, expending and the rest of it, we should be prepared for a failure of that, and we should be prepared for the situation turning violent inside of Pakistan. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, there is this sense that the group cannot really afford to go back to what it was. Simply, um, I think out of fear that they will lose the recognition and I think the support they so badly need to legitimize their place in Afghanistan, uh, even if it is within the context of, I think, uh, you know, an inclusive setup. But again, that's debatable. Um, but if you if you so, allow me a mm -hmm. question to sure. Steve, I, I think with, sure because please, we've please talked about how the how the West is going to you know mm -hmm. uh, approach this, mm -hmm. and and I talked about the Cash Twenty Two. Uh, what if this pure speculation? Uh, what if they come to a, a settlement which creates something along the line. Now, obviously, not the Shia, Shia theocratic government, but a Sunni theocratic government mm. somewhat modeled along the line of Iran. Is that something which would be acceptable to the, uh, to the West? Is, is that something which will... And, and I'm saying that 
not just the Taliban, but also Uzbek, Hazara, uh, Tajik uh, stakeholders as part of that government. What, I, I missed the key thing you said along the lines of what? The, you know, the Shia, so Iran's Shia theocratic government. So along the lines of Sunni, Iran. Sunni, yeah. Sunni theocratic Sunni government Iran. along the lines. Iran. I mean, um, you know, I think uh, if that looked like Tehran, uh, you know, if there were it, Tehran circa, uh, 1998, 2002, in, in the era of relative uh, opening where there was independent filmmaking and, uh, you know, some normalization with uh, governments around the world and uh, a sense of, of cultural space and, and social participation and, yes, gender segregation, but full gender, uh, full access by women to uh, work and education. I don't know if we fight a war over that, uh, even though there will be lots of uh, journalists and human rights uh, advocates and, and researchers who will be trying to document the suffering uh, and the repression that unfolds in, in such a system. Um, I, don't, I, I think, you know, the, the expectations of the Taliban's governance in the West, as you know, are so low right now <laughs> that um, if the Taliban were to construct um, a system that, you know, that Amina might not want to live under, but which doesn't look like uh, the last Taliban emirate, um, you know, there'll be some openness to that in parts of the world and understanding that, well, the Taliban are evolving. Uh, and my, my question is, on what basis do we really expect that? Because when you look at the Taliban's record in the, er in the areas they've controlled, um, and you look at the record in the 90s, and you look at their own political philosophy, um, you know, they, they, they are a more international leadership than they were, obviously, in the 90s, through the experience of exile, through traveling to the Gulf. They watched the Arab Spring. They saw a Muslim Brotherhood come and go in Egypt. Uh, you know, they have the models of Hamas and Hezbollah in their discourse, you know, in terms of political economies that are theocratic, not just Iran. So, you know, you, you might expect them to be going to a lot of conferences and debating different kinds of constitutional systems. And that's, I don't really see that happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see them really rooted in the ideology of the original emirate. And when they gain control of uh, territory in Afghanistan, they govern much as they did before. Now, there are changes, they have new leadership, it's more plural, it's more international, they have a different attitude towards social media and technology and communications than they did in the 90s. Um, but look, it doesn't really matter what I predict or you predict, uh, Ijaz, I think you said it right. I don't know, I don't know what to expect, mm -hmm. but I, as a journalist, I look to people's records to try to predict their conduct in the future. And when I look at the Taliban's record, I just don't see an experience of exile that has broadened their horizons, even in the realm of Islamist political discourse. Uh, Steve, I, if I may, and this might be very naive on my part, but if that is the case, then why did the Americans sign an agreement with the Taliban? Because Donald Trump wanted the heck out of Afghanistan yesterday. Yeah, but that's convenient. But then you have to find a way to deal with the group now that they're there. Anyway, all right. I, I think this is a never ending debate. I have so many questions and I'm trying to cover all of them, but it's very difficult and we are short on time. And uh, this is a question that again goes back to Pakistan there too. And of course they're open to both the panelists. And one is that will Afghanistan continue to navigate the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan? And at this particular juncture, uh, can you comment on why exactly the Biden administration did not uh, engage and coordinate with Pakistan. And this is something that Sen uh, Senator Lindsey Graham had also talked about. Engage in what? Uh, why they didn't engage and consult Pakistan, you know, at this particular critical juncture. You mean this summer or during the Doha process? Well, I think particularly, you know, this entire transition of power and this, you know, exit right. that is taking place, yeah. Yeah, well, they and, and whether the relationship will continue to be navigated by, you know, the events in Afghanistan. 
Yeah, uh, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think for a while it'll certainly be colored by it because of uh, just the dramatic events of this summer and their political significance in the United States. I think it's going to be difficult to, um, you know, reset the U.S.-Pakistan relationship around uh, geoeconomics and and other other issues and interests. Um, there's going to be a, there's always a limited bandwidth in American foreign policy, and and now um, the, the Biden administration, as we've discussed this before, is going to be trying to extract itself from the political pain that the events of this summer have created for the administration, and and so they'll be looking to Pakistan to mm -hmm. help address the crises in Afghanistan. Um, you know, first and foremost, but of course, Pakistan will have its own agenda, which um, as ever will be broader than the U.S. agenda and, and so, you know, that, that dialogue will, will recur. Um, uh, so remind me, was there another question embedded in there? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. whether we will see the expansion or, you know, the contours of the bilateral relationship, as you said, Pakistan would want that, but it clearly yeah seems that the Biden administration is not interested. Oh, and you asked why they didn't consult. Well, mm, I think mm. that the, the, um, the governments of uh, Britain, France, and Germany are asking the same questions. So, uh, or to the extent that, I mean, I've talked to them and, and their experience was um, during the review and leading up to the rather abrupt and, you know, in many parts of the world, kind of stunning announcement, that's it, we're done. Um, they were briefed about where the Biden administration was going, but they weren't really consulted. And uh, when they expressed concerns and objections about the way the Biden administration was um, uh, defining the, the speed and the course of their withdrawal, um, they they weren't they didn't feel that they were heard or that their or that their interests were even properly accounted for. As you can see, I mean, they've all been scrambling. All these NATO governments. Have been scrambling, you know, to get out under the umbrella of the U.S. Uh, Marines and forces that are there, and to rescue their own nationals and to rescue their own Afghan um, partners, uh, and you know they've all had their and and I don't I don't know how how this how much this comes through you know in where you guys are, but I mean for those of us who have Afghan friends and and colleagues. Mm -hmm. Uh, who we've worked with uh, on the ground over there. You know, we have been sleepless for two weeks trying to get people out, trying to get them on planes when they're frightened. And all I can tell you, and we've had some success and some frustrations, um, it is a nightmare. I mean, it is totally chaotic. And from what I'm learning through the experience, but also talking to others, everybody is having the same experience. I mean, the Qataris are having a nightmarish experience of trying to get people in and out of the airport. The, you know, the Danes and the French and the and the Germans and the British, it is worse than it looks. Uh, and I can understand now why the president of the United States wants to end it because it is one of the and, and you know they're they're telling this story about the Berlin airlift and and pumping out a lot of statistics that are true. They did get a lot of people out. Uh, and they're continuing to work hard, but the operation is is a mess, and mm. and it's going to color uh, American experience of of Afghanistan at the White House. I mean, it's it's they're going to suffer from post traumatic stress disorder. I think having run this operation for at least a few months, because uh, it has been the the you know I, it's hard to think in American experience. Uh, you know, we we often. Um, break things in the world when we go out to try to fix them, but we usually don't do it in such chaos um, as this. Um, and, you know, this is on the level of Somalia, Black Hawk Down, or, you know, the failed rescue mission in Iran in 1980. This is going to be, a, and Saigon. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was a president who on July 8th, July 8th said, mm -hmm. you're never going to see helicopters on the rooftop uh, like you did on the Amer in Saigon. Uh, it's just not going to happen. He said that on July 8th in public. So just to think about what a, what a trauma this is uh, for the administration and, and for anybody connected in the military and the intelligence services and other places who have long experience and diplomats who have long experience in Afghanistan. 
I mean, it's just nightmarish. And it's, 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 it's not going to be sort of washed away in two months or, or, or six months, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Well, given what you've said, um, considering the attacks that have also taken place yesterday, is there a possibility that the Americans could postpone the withdrawal of August 31st? Is that is something that maybe certain, you know, policymakers in the U.S. are talking about? I, I think it's I think it's unlikely because um, I, I think partly um, it's tactically difficult to imagine how you would um, stabilize the the rescue operations because of the, the just the geometry of the airport surrounded by five thousand you know essentially U.S. soldiers protecting the perimeter. Um, the Taliban have helped move the perimeter out but there's still a perimeter and it's vulnerable to events like the ones we saw yesterday with multiple suicide bombings, complex attacks. And this is before uh, the Taliban or ISK decide that they've had enough and they start rocketing the airport or trying to use anti-aircraft weapons to disrupt flights. That hasn't happened yet, but suicide bombing is a signal that this is not a sustainable perimeter. So there's thousands of US citizens or there's 1500 or so US citizens outside the perimeter right now. Uh, the United States maybe has a grip on 500 of them. There are British, Australian, French, German citizens outside who cannot get into the airport, Never mind tens of thousands of Afghan former uh, interpreters, employees, journalists, uh, others who are eligible for refuge under the US uh, and European systems who are never going to get through that through that airport. And if and if you just tried to keep the airport uh, open um, with with a hard perimeter enforced by US military, each day would get worse than the day before uh, because it's just a sitting target and there's no way to push the perimeter out or to drive into the city and rescue people. It's just it's, uh, it's, it, it does look like Mogadishu uh, in that Black Hawk Down period that Pakistan uh, had a, an unhappy experience of as well. You have, you know, you have a hostile urban environment, bases, and, and yes, you can go out and come back, but every time you move, you're putting your, your people at risk, and it's very difficult to accomplish even small-scale missions of that type. I mean, a lot of heroic work has been done, and some, a lot of people have been rescued, every one of them you know, feels like a miracle, honestly, for the ones that uh, I've been around. But a lot of people are going to be left behind. And, it, it, you know, the Taliban are going to be in a difficult position because they're going to be urged to allow um, uh, legal qualified travelers to travel. I mean, the UN is going to urge them to follow international law about uh, migration and, and free travel. And there are going to be thousands and thousands of Afghans who are going to say, even after the airport shuts, whatever happens to it after the Taliban take it over, they'll presumably they'll reopen it to commercial flights and so forth. All right. So, what kind of documentation is going to be required to leave Afghanistan in the future? Our people are going to start to move overland toward uh, Pakistan, towards T Tajikistan, yeah. towards mm -hmm. Iran, and how is that going to evolve? This is going to be a huge administrative problem for the Taliban. Are they really prepared to manage that? with international eyes on them and so forth, I think it's gonna be a very difficult part of the next six months for them. Sorry, yeah, I was saying you can give your comments to and also if you could give your views on what the Pakistanis expect from the Americans since we haven't really achieved a lot in this relationship, it hasn't evolved in any way. Are there any chances of the relationship evolving if at all in your comments as well? Okay. Now, first, the, the airport mess. Uh, it's, uh, uh, since Steve mentioned uh, Black Hawk Down, uh, I will be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, the role played by uh, Pakistani troops, especially 19 Lancers, uh, which uh, helped rescue uh, the American troops from that, uh, from that ambush. Um, but here's the thing. There was terrible planning on the part of uh, Biden administration. As a matter of fact, if you juxtapose this with the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Soviet withdrawal looks like a textbook example of how to withdraw militarily. That's something that the United States cannot claim. 
uh, Anthony Blinken, before the fall of Kabul, said, uh, you know, this is not cyber. And I think he's right. Uh, this is worse than cyber. Uh, this is uh, not cyber on 2.0. This is uh, Kabul uh, 2021. The, the statements about evacuation was what created the panic and the rush. Uh, the United States, uh, if William Burns can meet with the Taliban leaders, they could have also created some kind of system whereby the, the Taliban would have you know, uh, sort of control the flow of people coming to uh, the airport. Uh, they could have held the outer perimeter. The, uh, uh, you know, inner perimeter could have been held by, by the U.S. troops or by the Turkish troops. That did not happen. Uh, they did not uh, work out these arrangements with Pakistan. After all, you and I know that Pakistan International Airlines has been uh, managing special flights, bringing people out, uh, they could have done this even better, but for the terrible mess that uh, the U.S. presence has created. I must also say that, uh, you know, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham was, since we were talking about the U.S. Pakistan thing, was really prescient. And I can, I can read out his tweets from 22nd June. And he says, stunning to hear that President Biden hasn't reached out to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, regarding the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and Afghanistan. And then he follows it up by saying, how do we expect our withdrawal from Afghanistan to be effective without coordinating with Pakistan? Clearly, the Biden administration believes that our problems in Afghanistan are behind us. So this is not my assessment. This is an assessment by Lindsey Graham. And I think he's you know, absolutely right in what he said. So... Uh, if blame has to be apportioned, uh, what happened uh, or what is still happening at the Kabul airport and in and around, uh, it goes straight to the United States and to some extent uh, to the U.S. allies. And I think it is still time uh, for the U.S. to begin coordinating with Pakistan on the one hand and Taliban on the other. I mean, they are there, the people are there. Uh, and, and of course, as we have seen with the two suicide bombing, there is a clear and present danger of Daesh, uh, which I said in my presentation is a violent spoiler. They would like to uh, create as much mayhem as possible. Uh, they could fire, he was right, they could, have, you know, they could fire rockets at the airport. So these are issues that need to be worked out uh, with a lot of gravitas. It's not just about, and you know, President Biden saying that we are going to avenge this and we are going to use maximum force. None of this is going to work. This is not a, a time for grandstanding. This is a time for, uh, you know, formulating a, a workable policy that can, and these things can be worked out with the Taliban. I mean, I'm sure uh, Burns, uh, you know, uh, these, these are things that, uh, that were on his agenda. And I think in the, in the coming days, it will be in the fitness of things for the U.S. administration uh, to, to, you know, get out of this fateful hubris and, and, and begin to uh, rethink uh, engagement with uh, actors on the ground. I'm not talking about the, the medium to long term thing. I'm talking simply about evacuations right now, which is a basic humanitarian thing. I mean, look at the epitaph that's being written. I mean, look at the visuals of a globe trotter taxiing with people, you know, getting onto its, its uh, landing gear and, and running alongside the, uh, uh, that aircraft. So I think these are issues that the Biden administration will have to work out very clearly. Sure. Um, well, I think we are coming to the end of this, this uh, discussion. So. Um, there were many questions. I will just leave one question and maybe you both could answer that in your concluding remarks before I hand over the floor to uh, Umar, which is um, how do you perceive this new regional consensus, you know, with Afghanistan's immediate neighbors, which is Iran, Pakistan, uh, you know, the Russians and more so now China and whether China or for that matter, let me not say China, which country could play the role of a credible interlocker uh, in this particular scenario post, if we do see the formation of this inclusive uh, government we're also eagerly waiting for. First to Steve and, and then to Ijaz. 
Well, I don't think any one of those nations can play the role of a credible interlocutor at this stage. Um, all of them are essential to a successful outcome, but none of them is in a position to lead, in my opinion. Um, so uh, there are times when, uh, you know, when you have rare uh, UN envoys like Lakhdar Brahimi who can be highly effective, um, you know, maybe this is a moment where the UN could identify someone uh, with that level of sophistication and experience to, to facilitate. It's not going to be to, to, um, to control uh, an outcome, but to create a process that is constructive because um, there's gonna be so many fault lines uh, there. Um, so that's, that's my sense of it. I think uh, what a lot of those nations have in common, uh, including with the United States um, and, and its European allies, um, you know, it's certainly true of Pakistan, it's true of Iran, it's true of Russia, it's true of China. Um, they all uh, fear the consequences of failed politics in Afghanistan. They all have reason to fear cross-border violence being revived through an intensifying civil war or the or the revival of um, you know, groups with international millenary and revolutionary um, ambitions, what we would call uh, legally in the United States terrorism. So they all, they're all worried about that. Russia's worried about its southern frontier. Um, China's worried about its west. Pakistan has ample reason to worry about a revival of the kind of domestic instability it experienced uh, just a decade ago. Um, and, and the United States and, and Europe came out here uh, in the first instance in this iteration for counterterrorism, and that's their single biggest priority. So, you know, there's, there is a lot there around that table, um, but who can bring it together to your question about who takes the lead in diplomacy? And I, I mean, I, this is not my you know, I'm not a professional diplomat, but my sense is that there is no one country that could succeed, certainly not the United States uh, right now. Um, so, you know, UN is always uh, a kind of a desperate institution to rely upon, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but there are individuals who come out under UN auspices from time to time who, who really do make a difference. Uh, so maybe there's somebody out there waiting to rise to the occasion. And would you like to say anything to conclude before I hand it over to Ijaz? No, I, I just, I welcome your uh, invitation. I really enjoyed the conversation. I do have one favor to ask Ijaz, if you remember, just write this down it, as a journalist to journalist. I'm really interested in, you mentioned Mullah uh, eight years of imprisonment in Pakistan. If there's any good Pakistani journalism about that, um, clips or, or links, uh, send it to me because I, I, I'm very interested in reading about it. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I know, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I largely agree with uh, Steve Cole, uh, but there are a couple of things. One is that uh, there is, uh, it seems to me, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the Biden administration might be smarter than that, but it seems to me that this regional consensus, uh, which involves, uh, you know, China, Russia, Pakistan, uh, might be something that the United States, instead of looking uh, purely, uh, you know, with reference to Afghanistan and how Afghanistan can be stabilized, uh, it might be looked at in terms of uh, U.S. relations with China and Russia, which, as we all know, um, are uh, going south uh, in more ways than one, and uh, that uh, obviously. Uh, would be uh, a bad omen for uh, stability in Afghanistan. I, I do believe, uh, you know, uh, that America still has a role to play in Afghanistan. Mm. And it will depend on how the U.S. formulates its policy. Uh, it doesn't have to be upfront for that. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with what Steve has uh, said about pulling in the U.N., having someone like Brahimi or Wendell or, you know, the, the other people uh, that, that could be uh, dealing with Afghanistan. But we also know that the UN in and of itself uh, yeah. is not an organization that can, that can get things done. It, it, it's dependent on the powerful member states to do that. 
but uh, you know uh, the us will probably have to be patient look at how the situation is evolving instead of already presupposing that the situation will turn out in a way where it might get down to over the horizon counter terrorism you know operations which again frankly uh, this over the horizon thing is is not as easy as uh, it is made out to be it's costly it's and uh, you know how far it can be effective in the force would require another another long mm. discussion so so i think uh, you know uh, we still have to expend diplomatic capital on this uh, pakistan is uh, of course prepared uh, we all know that uh, the national security advisor dr moeed yusuf has had two meetings with uh, you know the us national security <laughs> advisor there is an agenda it's uh, uh, it's focused on afghanistan but it's much more than afghanistan and i think those mm-hmm. are areas of cooperation that need to be explored and uh, if if uh, that happens then i think the us will have a positive role it, it uh, you know uh, it still has that leadership role and then the regional countries to the extent of the convergence of interests in the region uh, would be all too happy to help with the us effort thank you well i think the conversation has been extremely um, illuminating and by far we can say that there afghanistan has a very long way to go before uh, it becomes stable and i will say that in the end that i think afghanistan should be viewed as a collective and i think as a shared responsibility and one only hopes that the transition which has been relatively peaceful so far continues and uh, hopefully we do see this inclusive political setup that unlike other governments will be responsible countable and i think one that will serve the afghan people which it hasn't so far so with these uh, concluding remarks from my side i would like to thank once again dr steve cole and ijaz haider and i will hand the floor back to umar thank you uh, thank you so much ms amna i would now request acting president a pre uh, brigadier rashid wali janjua for his uh, concluding remarks over to you sir uh, thank you very much uh, umar and uh, i take this opportunity to thank uh, all participants uh, for a very absorbing discussion and i think uh, most important take away from today's discourse is that afghanistan uh, needs an active international engagement and uh, a facilitation by the regional countries and international community together in order to uh, uh, ensure that there is peace and stability and uh, it's a shared responsibility the contours of uh, afghan situation are still not very very clear uh, taliban are uh, they have uh, come with force but uh, their overtures display a need to form an inclusive government till the time that inclusive government is formed and uh, while its formation is in place how the international community facilitates them doing so uh, would uh, be the most important factor and uh, as we say that uh, afghanistan uh, is the only riddle which is uh, very difficult to uh, solve uh, because it has not been amenable to very convenient solutions in the past and uh, another very important takeaway from today's discourse is that uh, the role of united states would still be very very crucial and uh, the region as well as pakistan would look forward to its active uh, involvement in a very facilitative mode so as to ensure that whatever united states did by way of uh, stabilization infrastructure development does not go waste and uh, the whole effort of two decades is fructified properly in the shape of a stable and prosperous afghanistan so i thank uh, once again the distinguished uh, speaker and the discussions and the panelists so over to you umar and uh, uh, once again thanks from my side thank you so much sir uh, ladies and gentlemen this brings us to the end of today's webinar i just like to thank uh, mr steve cole uh, dr jaz heather and uh, ms samna khan for uh, the excellent moderation um, uh, thank you all for your active participation please follow us on our social media platforms to stay updated uh, with our research activities thank you goodbye
Thank you.